Amen. Thank you for that great song. Those hymns just never go out of date, do they? So much truth and doctrine uh, in those grand old hymns. Is life made up of chances or choices? There are a lot of people who will say, well, I never had a chance. Hmm. Is it not often the case that the real issue is not that you didn't have a chance, but that you never made the right choice? Years ago, I was able to see a man come to Christ uh, in my ministry that uh, had been a very prosperous man. At one point, he was making through gas wells more than $40,000 a month. Would that, would that handle your budget? $40,000 a month? And, uh, and yet, because of an addiction to gambling and other bad investments that he made, he was penniless when I met him. And about to lose uh, his home, his land, everything. And he asked me a question shortly after making the choice to follow Jesus. He said, can you explain to me why you Baptists, <laughs> he had never been around Baptists before, why you Baptists are so opposed to gambling? And I said to him, gambling preys on the poor and ignorant now, I have other reasons that I'm opposed to it. I have a problem with greed and all of those kinds of things. And folks, to this very moment, I have not bought any lottery ticket of any kind. None whatsoever. But I said that it preys on the poor and ignorant. It exploits them. And that alone is enough to make me against it. And he looked at me and he said, that's me, poor and ignorant. <laughs> We had a wonderful friendship and relationship as I got to serve uh, as his pastor. But, you know, there again, is it chance? Is that all life is? Is life just about, you know, what chance is given to you? Or, or do we not need to pay more careful attention to choices? I think the answer is pretty obvious, don't you? Something about changing the calendar awakens us to the urgency of taking action. A lot of people wait for an opportunity to present itself. But you know what I've learned? And I've learned it from the Word of God. We are supposed to present the opportunity. We can present the opportunity for a new life. That's exactly what God invites us to do over and over again in His Word. He presents us with an opportunity for a new beginning, for a fresh strength, for a fresh insight, for a fresh wisdom about life. Life is an opportunity. And the possibilities are endless. If you will seize the day. Look at Ephesians 5 with me. Ephesians 5, and I'm going to pick up for our purpose right now at verse 15. So look at Ephesians 5, 15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Particularly, I want to focus in upon those words, make the most of every opportunity. And I want to also note with you this word of caution about a careless approach to life. You know, we read a little while ago at the beginning of our service from Proverbs chapter 1, verses 20 uh, and following. And perhaps some of you thought, wow, that's, that's kind of a dark and somber passage uh, to be reading here at the beginning of a new year. Well, let me give you the last verse in the passage. If you'll find Proverbs 1 with me again, 
I want you to notice verse 33. Remember that passage about, you know, where God is saying or wisdom is saying as God personifies wisdom, I'll, I'll mock you when calamity comes. But look at verse 33. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. That's quite a promise. And what that passage presents to us is what I've already been saying. It presents to us an opportunity. A choice to be made. And that choice will determine the outcome. So our opening word today is take care. Be very careful how you live. Take care. Think about your life. Recognize that every day you're making choices. Just, just for fun, let me say that you're going to decide every day what kind of attitude you're going to have. You don't have control over all the circumstances in your life. But you do have control over your attitude. You either can get up and say, good Lord, morning. Or good morning, Lord. It's up to you. You have the choice. And on and on we go through life. We have the possibility, the opportunity to live a wise and productive life. Richard Swenson wrote a book called Overload. That's an interesting title. In which we're cautioned not only about the destructive things uh, that can happen to us in life if we make unwise choices, but some of the choices that on the surface may look like good choices. But in fact, they too can have dire consequences. In the book Overload, he talks about how high anxiety uh, is so commonplace in the day in which we live. That people are struggling uh, with mood problems. They struggle with depression. They struggle, struggle with all kinds of worries and anxieties. And he, in his book Overload, presents these areas. Listen to this. I want you to get this. He says, some of us are making too many commitments. Now, you know, being a pastor, let me explore that with you just a second. Do you know there are a lot of people who have no time to grow in Christ because they've made so many commitments to worldly pursuits? You know, I, I, there was a little funny thing that, that uh, used to be passed around. In fact, I've received an email with it some time ago where uh, a man is writing to his pastor toward the beginning of the year. And, and as he writes the letter, he says to his pastor, he says, Pastor, we've resolved as our New Year's resolution to be in church more. And then he begins to list all the Sundays he's going to be out. And by the time he's done, he's going to be there about three Sundays. You know, he said, I'm looking forward to seeing you. Well, he's just got so many commitments. So many commitments. And, and in life, you just don't need to be a member of every club. And I'm going to say something you'll hear very few pastors say. You don't need to do everything that the church is doing. I know people who've hurt their own families by trying to do so much church work that they had no time for family. And I don't advocate that. Uh, I don't believe that's what God wants us to do. Now, I believe we need to be committed and I, th I believe we need to be involved. But I want you to know that you can make too many commitments and they look so good. But the fact is, too many commitments can be as negative in the consequences as some of the other things that are more obviously negative upon our lives. Secondly, too many possessions. Oh, get your steel-toed shoots on. Some of you just have too much junk. Now, I don't mean it's junk. It might be the most valuable stuff in the world. But you just don't need all that. You don't need it. Do you know that the stuff we have causes stress for us? It really does. And if you don't believe it, just clean out your closet this afternoon. And notice how good you feel. You know, when you just sort of get rid of those shoes you haven't worn in eight years. And, you know, and that tie that you're not ever going to wear again, but you don't want to throw it away because Aunt Janie gave it to you. You know, just, just move some things. You see, we, we, and this is one of the things the book says, we, we let our possessions possess us. We think we can't live without them, and that's a lie. We don't need all the things that we have in life. So we overload with possessions. That plays very well into this emphasis, breaking free. 
Some of us just need to break free from our enslavement to stuff. You know, there's a commercial on right now. I've seen it uh, in conjunction with some sports I've been watching of a young man just keeps reaching in a bag and he pulls out something else. He reaches a bag and he pulls out something else. It's, it's an electronics commercial, you know, and perhaps you've seen it. And I thought to myself, yes, that, that is a metaphor for our age. I've got to have the next gizmo. I can't live without the next device. We ought to go around calling ourselves Mr. Gadget. Or Mrs. Gadget, I've got to have that gadget. My life won't be complete if I don't have that new gadget. Oh, I know I've made you mad, but that's all right. That's my job. I make somebody mad every week. It was just your week. Possessions. We get overloaded with stuff. Work. You know, sometimes we get ourselves so deep in debt, we nearly work ourselves to death trying to pay for all the stuff we've decided we just had to have. Do you know it was prophesied in the 1960s that by this time, you know how they do those New Year's projections, by this time they said the average person would work 22 hours a week. Because we'd make so many advances, so many labor-saving devices that we just have to work 22 hours a week. But you know what the reality is? People are working more than they ever have before. That's the reality. They don't know when to quit. I mean, they go to lunch and they answer 15 emails on their iPhone while they're eating lunch. Too much work. And somehow we believe that there is something holy about that. But I want to tell you that that can take your heart away from God. And of course, we all know about the information overload. Just too much information. Not all information is equal. You've got to be discerning in the day in which we live. What is worthy of your time and what isn't? What book might be profitable for you to read and what book is just a waste of paper? There's an information overload. This passage of Scripture also tells us to to make the most of our opportunities. You know, the old English on that was redeem the time, buy back the time. Did you know that time is your most valuable asset? Not your car, not your house, your time. It's the most valuable asset that you have. People magazine several years ago had an article, and the title of the article was Dead Ahead, Dead Ahead. And in the article, it told about a clock that was manufactured, uh, that could be bought. I don't think it's still around, but the, the clock was manufactured and could be bought that was programmed so that you could put your present age in and then it would calculate how many hours, minutes, days, etc. that you had between your age and the average age of death for somebody your age so that any time you could look at that clock and know how much time you had left if you lived an average lifespan. Anybody want to buy that one? Boy, talk about morbid. That's morbid. But I, but I want to tell you that the issue here is at least we need to contemplate the brevity of our lives. We need to buy back the time, make the most of every opportunity because of the nature of human life. We tend to deny the reality that we're running out of time. Remember what I told the children? We think time goes round and round, but it doesn't. It runs out. Now, I'm not talking about eternity. We'll live forever in the Lord Jesus. But so far as this world is concerned, we're going to run out of time. And we need to be sober enough to realize that. People live in denial of that reality, constantly thinking, well, I really need to correct this, but not yet. Another reason we need to redeem the time is because of the peril of procrastination. We're just so good at putting things off. You know, I've often thought about what the Word of God says. It says to him or her, that is, who knows to do good and does it not, to them it is sin. We don't even think of that as sin. We don't think of it as sin to procrastinate, to put off doing what we are impressed that we should do. And particularly I'm speaking here about things that we know that the Lord would have us do. 
We can come up with so many excuses not to act on what God impresses us to act upon. I was witnessing to a man some years ago. He was 80 years of age in pretty good health. And I shared the plan of salvation with him. I told him about God's love. And he said, yes, I know God loves me. And I said, but do you understand that sin separates us from God? He said, well, let's talk about that. And I talked to him about, about how sin separates us from God and showed him scriptures like Isaiah 59, 2. Your sins have separated between you and your God and your iniquities have hid his face from you. And then I told him about how he could find forgiveness and, and enter into a new relationship with God. And when I finished, I said, now, did you understand everything that we shared? He said, yes, I did. I said, well, what do you think? Would you like to receive Jesus? Now, remember, he's past 80 years of age, and he said, well, I'm just not ready yet. Well, how long does he think he's going to live? It's absolutely astounding how people put off decisions that they know and acknowledge are important but they just wait inexplicably foolishly they wait he died suddenly in the middle of the night so far as I know unprepared to meet God also the nature of the world notice it says the days are evil what does that mean? Well, when Paul wrote this, there was great widespread persecution of believers. And he was acknowledging the reality that they lived constantly being pursued by the evil one and his minions. But you know, in a way, that's not different today. The world is always on the attack. The Bible says that Satan is like a roaring lion who moves around seeking those he might devour. Just back up in Ephesians 5 and catch me at verse 3. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. That's why. Because the world has a way of consuming our lives and our health and our well-being in its pursuits. So because of the nature of this present evil world, we need to redeem the time. We need to make the most of our life and of our opportunity. But finally, this passage speaks to me and to us about living in the Spirit. I want you to look back down into the text there. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, listen to this, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You know, I was thinking about that analogy of being wakened from sleep. And it occurred to me that when someone wakes you, an external stimulus brings us to our senses and to our true selves. Not our dream self, but our true self. God, from the outside of our lives, needs to awaken us so that we can be wide awake. My children... Recall very well that one of my favorite things to do in the morning was to walk in their room where they were sleeping to wake them up. And I would quote the old King James here, Wake thou that sleepest! Oh, they just loved it. 
And then I would break into that old song, rise and shine and give God the glory, glory. They just loved it. They enjoyed it so much. They probably want that sung at my funeral or something. But God has to, to waken us from the outside. He has to stimulate us from without and cause us to come to our senses and to our true self. Because when you're caught up in the world, the flesh, and the devil, you're not you. You know why I know that? Because when Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son, there's a little phrase in there I don't want you to miss. When he's in the hogwalla, far from his family, when he is lost from his purpose for life, when he's lost everything that he has, it says these words. Jesus said these words about him. And when he came to himself, when he came to himself. God wants to awaken us to our senses and to our true selves and wants us to walk in the Spirit. I love the way that passage concludes. It says uh, that we are not to be drunk with wine wherein there is excess, but instead we are to be filled with the Spirit. We're to speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and sing and make music in our hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks through the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we seem to think that uh, life being filled with the Spirit is reserved for a few special Christians. Listen, here's what's going on. So many professing Christians have lived so long in a subnormal condition that when somebody becomes normal, that is filled with the Spirit, they think they're abnormal. When you live subnormal, less than God intended, and you encounter normal filled with the Holy Spirit, then you say, well, he's just a good Christian. He's a really good Christian. I'm a Christian, but he's a good Christian. Ah, He's just normal. She's just normal. That's what God wants to awaken us to. Just to be normal in Jesus Christ. Stand with me this morning. Here again is an opportunity. An opportunity for you to take a stand and say, I've decided to follow Jesus. I'm awake. <laughs> God is awakening me to some things that need to change. Or I'm awake and realize that I need to be a part of a family of believers. I need to grow in Christ. That needs to be a priority. I'm going to lay aside whatever commitments and whatever distractions that I have so that I can focus on being the person God made me to be when He created me. Let's pray. Father, I pray today. Lord, that we could hear you far beyond my words. Lord, that through Scripture, you would speak. And help us to understand that today really is an opportunity. And there can be a new beginning. Help us to know, Lord Jesus, that you are the way. And that you are for us, as the Word says, wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Renew our commitment to you today, Lord, and bring others to commit to you is our prayer in your name. Amen. We sing together. We invite you to come. <laughs>